Welcome back, everybody. So today we are going to kind of build off of what we talked about last time, which really kind of laid the groundwork for what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the course, which is quantum computing. So um, to review what we've covered so far, so let me just share my screen and uh, jump over. So what we've covered so far is largely probabilistic reversible computing. And the basic idea, again, behind that is that the fundamental objects that we have for uh, probabilistic reversible computing are the probability distribution. And, you know, we can end up expressing the probability distribution over n bits as the sum from x equals 0 to 2 to the n p sub x e x, such that, of course, the sum over x, px, is equal to 1. Now, the probability of a given configuration, p sub x, can then, of course, as we mentioned before, be found by multiplying the transpose of the um, computational basis vector, ex, with the probability vector p. OK? And then all legal operations are permutation matrices. So for example, you know, a permutation matrix, you know, simplest one that we've seen, of course, was like not, which ends up doing the following. It maps E0 to E1 and E1 to E0. So this is a permutation. And specifically, all such gates have to end up satisfying that G inverse exists. And furthermore, that G inverse is actually equal to G transpose. Now, in the case of not, the transpose is kind of trivial, right? It's the transpose is just itself. So that isn't um, that isn't a very interesting operation. But to see something that's a little bit more general. Let's uh, we could take a look at something like an adder mod four. So an adder mod four, if you work it out, would be could be given the following matrix representation. It would be. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Like this over here. Now, if we take a look at the transpose of add, the transpose of add in this representation is the following matrix. We then would have uh, that, that. Okay, now if you multiply the two, we end up finding, of course, that add transpose add is equal to the identity matrix, which is just the matrix with ones all over the diagonal. Therefore, add transpose is the inverse of add. So that is how we um, how we could find the inverse with a probabilistic uh, um, reversible gate. It's really just the transpose of that one. In quantum, everything looks practically identical. In quantum, the first, the property we have is that instead of a probability distribution, we've got what we call a quantum state or a quantum state vector. And, oh, this should be two to the n minus one. I apologize. The quantum state vector is equal to the sum over x equals 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 psi x e x. Now, such that the sum over x absolute value of psi x squared is equal to 1. Now, the probability of measuring a quantum state and getting an outcome px 
just like before, is that the probability of seeing bit string x is equal to the absolute value of ex transpose psi vector squared. Okay, now here, for those of you who aren't that familiar with complex analysis, um, this absolute value here is the complex absolute value of, um, of a quantity. So for example, you know, if in general, we can write a number, let's say um, Z in the form of a X um, or sorry, of X plus I Y. Okay, where both X and Y are real and I is the square root of negative one. So this is a generic expression that we have for a complex number. The absolute value of complex number squared is just equal to Z times what it's, what's called as complex conjugate, which we'll denote with a star. And that is equal to the complex conjugate of a number is the exact same number, but we flip the sign of the imaginary component. So here, this is X plus IY times X minus IY. When we multiply these two guys together, we end up getting that this is x squared plus y squared. So it really actually just looks like the Euclidean norm. In fact, there's a, there's a direct equivalence between the um, uh, comp uh, complex numbers and R2. At least, you know, you can create a one-to-one -one mapping between them. So anyways, the this is the, uh, in quantum mechanics, how we compute the probability of measuring a, se a, se a set of quantum bits and getting the outcome uh, X. And so, you know, just to give you an example of this, right? Let's uh, imagine we had a quantum state um, and this quantum state is going to be for a single quantum bit. I could have the state one over root two, E zero plus E one then the probability of zero would be equal to just, of course, the absolute value of E naught transpose psi squared, which is just one over root two squared, which is of course, one half. Now, okay, this is, this of course, isn't the entirety of what we could end up seeing with quantum states. We could, I could, have had a quantum state that would be of the form i e zero, in which case p of zero would be exactly the same. It would be now the absolute value of i over square root two squared equals one half. So, okay, that's an example of how you would figure out the probability of a given configuration. And now all legal operations in quantum computing are unitary matrices. Okay, so before, um, and by unitary, what I mean is I mean that we have a matrix that satisfies U dagger now is equal to U inverse. So let me just explain what I mean by this, this dagger and give you a little bit better of an idea of um, what unitary matrices are. So unitary matrices, you know, or um, this dagger operation first is the dagger of a vector. Um, let's consider uh, the, a matrix actually, sorry, a matrix A, B, C, D. If we take the dagger, which is often called the adjoint of this matrix, what we would do is we just take the um, conjugate transpose of it. So we take the same matrix and we take the complex conjugate of absolutely everything. And then we transpose the matrix. So the reason why we do this is because of the fact that what, we, what we'll want to do is we'll want to be able to come up with a notion of a transpose that ends up allowing quantum state vectors to have a nice relationships 
uh, in terms of their inner products with each other. And this is extremely useful for defining a nice inner product on quantum distributions. So that's the definition of, of the adjoint. It really is just like the transpose that we ended up seeing that it inverts a um, permutation matrix, but it's generalized to the case where we have complex numbers. And so it does the exact same thing, except it also takes the complex conjugate. All right, and so then unitary matrices, again, from this, uh, this definition have the property that, you know, um, as I said before, U dagger is equal to U inverse. So what's an example of a unitary matrix? Well, actually, all, almost all the matrices that we've seen so far in this course actually happen to be unitary. So to give you an idea about this, let's take a look at not. Okay, not, this is a unitary operation because of the fact that if we take 0, 1, 1, 0, and we take its adjoint, well, that's equal to not, which is equal to trivially not inverse. So that implies that this is a unitary matrix. So that's, um, that's one of the beautiful properties of, uh, of unitary matrices uh, here. Uh, but I should also mention that the, there are cases that can end up showing up in, in quantum where the matrix itself doesn't actually necessarily need to be of this particular form. Here's an example of a unitary matrix that's val a valid operation in quantum computing that wouldn't make any sense in ordinary computing. So an operation here, this is known as the phase gate, and it has a matrix representation of the uh, in the following form. And what this will do is it'll again, it'll map E0 to E0, and it'll map E1 to IE1. All right, so that is, that is the, uh, the S gate. And you can see that this, of course, it looks very much like the identity transformation, but it puts this phase, this uh, factor of i in front of e1 that it doesn't put in front of e0. And so this, um, this matrix, if we compute its uh, adjoint over here, well, the, the, the transpose of this is exactly the same, but when I compute the complex conjugate of i, over here, what I get is I get one, zero, zero, minus i. And so if I multiply this times a one, zero, zero, i, this ends up being one, zero, zero, minus i times i. Now, because i squared equals minus one, this is equal to one, zero, zero, minus, minus one. And that is, of course, the identity matrix. So this implies that S dagger equals S inverse for this weird uh, phase game. So that's, that's, the, um, that's uh, one of the, the uh, nice properties about this. Um, the other thing that I wanna mention is that of course, if we take the conjugate transpose of our computational basis vectors, um, we end up getting just the transpose. So all, everything that we wrote in terms of reversible computing involving the, the transpose, we can change it to this conjugate transpose or adjoint operator because everything is real valued. So the conjugate part of the conjugate transpose don't, don't do anything, <laughs> all right? So that is um, unitary matrices. And so when we talk about, we talked about universality for ordinary computing. For, unit, for quantum computing, basically the notion of universality is, and we're gonna be building towards this. So I'm not gonna give a proof of this. It's, it, it can get actually a little involved, but what, what we mean by universality in quantum computing is that um, for every unitary matrix, you, in 
c 2 to the n by 2 to the n, there exists a, oh, and, sorry, and epsilon greater than zero, there exists a sequence of gates um, such that the product the, the product over all of these gate matrices minus the unitary the norm of all of that is less than or equal to epsilon and again this norm that i'm using here and i'll largely be using throughout the course uh is the um what's known as the induced two norm And it is uh, essentially the largest singular value of the matrix, i.e. it's like the uh, large, uh, largest absolute value of the eigenvalues of the difference in this case between the two. So what this basically says, and you, you might wonder, okay, well, what's the deal with this epsilon, right? We didn't see that at all for reversible computing. Well, it needs to show up in quantum computing because even on a single quantum bit, there's actually an infinite number of valid quantum operations that we can carry out. Conversely, there was only two operations that we could carry out in reversible classical computing. So the point is, is that because there's an infinite number, you can see that if we needed to actually precisely implement every quantum gate on even a single qubit, we would, we would require an infinite number of gates to specify that unitary matrix just by a counting argument. So for this reason, uh, or at least we need an infinite uh, number of, um, of gates taken from a discrete gate set in order to implement that. So for that reason, we end up only demanding with universality that we be able to closely approximate any unitary transformation, which again means any valid quantum transformation on the state. So now that I've talked about, you know, kind of how universality ends up working and you get a feel for um, what quantum computing is trying to do at the very least, I'd like to take a step back and actually introduce a new notation <laughs> or I should, I should say not so new notation for, for describing all of quantum computing. And this notation is known as Dirac notation. So Dirac notation, again, you know, was, is something that was invented in kind of the early days of quantum computing, or I'm sorry, not quantum computing, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics itself, you might think, you know, it's, it sounds really cool and really sexy, right? Like it's, a new cutting edge uh, idea. But just to put this in perspective, right? Quantum mechanics was really uh, founded in like circa about uh, 1900. So the dawn of the 20th century, quantum mechanics was, was kind of founded. The, um, the, it was formalized mostly by um, Eugene Wigner, and interestingly enough, John von Neumann. Now, those of you who come from a computer science background have undoubtedly heard of von Neumann. Von Neumann, he ended up proposing the von Neumann architecture, with, uh, as well as it did a lot of early research talking about the foundations of what we now think of as computer science. And this was done in this formalization was done in the 1930s. And I find this um, fact that von Neumann had this crucial role in the development of computer science and also the development of quantum mechanics fascinating because there's no hint whatsoever that von Neumann thought about combining these two ideas. In principle, he knew absolutely everything. In fact, all of the, the, the rest of the formalism that we're gonna be talking about is formalism that he helped, uh, he helped develop. So in principle, 
he could have developed quantum computing, but he never did. And instead, you know, for we ha- what we had to we had to do is we had to wait a full fifty years until uh, well, nineteen eighty two, when Feynman, Richard Feynman. I should mention Yuri Manin also ended up uh, independently doing this a couple of years earlier, but uh, um, Feynman, Feynman was a little bit more clear and, el- and eloquent about you know, what the role quantum computing might have would be. But in any case, Feynman ended up uh, saying that um, um, he, he ended up proposing quantum computing in 1982. However, everything was already on the table. And so quantum computing, in theory, could have actually been about the same age as ordinary computer science. But just from a historical accident, I think that most people until, until the 80s and really like the, the late 90s weren't fully ready to actually think about quantum, uh, quantum mechanics through the lens of computation. So that's what we're going to be doing now. But before, before getting into many of those details, let me uh, jump back and talk about Dirac notation. So Dirac notation is just actually a slightly more compact notation for um, describing quantum state vectors. So the basic idea behind it is, you know, let's say we wanted to do a state, uh, do a state one, zero, zero, right? We would write this as E naught tensor E naught. And similarly, if we wanted to describe a row vector one, zero, zero, this we would describe as E naught transpose tensor product with E naught transpose. Okay. Um, oh, and a property I should mention that's actually really kind of cool about transposes and in general adjoints is that if you have uh, a tensor product, of A tensor B in general, and we take the adjoint of that, that actually turns out to just be the tensor product of the adjoints. So tensor products are like beautiful. They've got all the properties that we would conceivably want over basically all of the uh, the operations. So that's one of the things that's very nice. And you can see that immediately that if we take the transpose of the tensor product, it's also just the tensor product of the transposes. So Cool. All right, so that this is the notation we normally use. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this notation is really, really annoying. The first reason is because of the fact that, well, we have to keep on writing these tensor products. So Dirac ended up proposing the following notation. Instead of writing the unit vectors like this, we will describe a unit vector in, in, quantum, uh, in quantum mechanics as just using the following language. So this over here describes a unit vector. And in particular, what we end up meaning by this is that if this is the sum over x, psi x, ex, then the sense in which it's a unit vector is just the sense that, you know, as we required earlier, the Euclidean norm of this vector is one, i.e. the sums of the squares of the, the coefficients add up to one, okay? So this is, this is Dirac notation. The thing that's really beautiful about Dirac notation is that with Dirac notation, there's, there's an implicit tensor product. So for example, if we have psi tensor phi, this in Dirac notation is equivalent to just writing psi phi, okay? So with Dirac notation, you don't need to end up uh, writing um, tensor products, though sometimes it can be useful to explicitly write it in, but you don't need to because the tensor product is is implicit in in this notation. The next thing that's really kind of awesome about, about Dirac notation is um, oh, uh, is that we will come up with the following notation to describe the transposes. So for example, uh, we would have, um, let's say we had um, sum over x, psi x, ex adjoint. 
okay? This over here, again, is just, we, we, would, we could write it as EX dagger. However, this over here can be, um, uh, is expressed in Dirac notation as the following object. No, it look, note it looks just like this quantity over here, but it's flipped the opposite direction. So it's kind of like a mirror image notationally of the other one. And this is just e defined to be equal to um, psi adjoint. And of course, it's uh, equal to that. Now, <laughs> um, Dirac uh, and, and company, back in the 1930s, where they got a little bit too clever with this notation. So I really apologize for this, uh, this joke. But the basic idea is that they came up with these cute names to describe it. These vectors that uh, of this form over here, they will they call ket vectors. And this form over here, they call a bra vector. You might wonder, okay, well, why these names? Well, I, I kid you not, the main reason why they call this a bra and that a cat is because of the fact that they wanted to call this object, sci-fi, a bracket. I know, right? That was probably like the height of humor in the 1930s, but um, in any case, that is the, um, that's the reason for this notation. And this over here, if we just draw it out, this is actually um, if equal to the sum over x, psi x, complex conjugate, phi x. And you can see that this actually uh, is I can be viewed as an inner product. But between the two vectors. So this is a it's a nice notation uh, between it. So if we have, you know, in vector notation, we have that psi phi. Okay, so this over here, what I mean is I mean the complex inner product between these two vectors. This in Dirac notation is also just psi phi. All right, so there's a lot of really nice things about, about Dirac notation that you don't end up getting from um, uh, ordinary vector notation. The other thing that I should, that is really kind of crucial with Dirac notation, at least when it's used properly, is that the each vector that you see like this, you automatically know its shape. You know, this, because of the fact that it's a ket vector, this is a column vector. And furthermore, because this notation only describes unit vectors, it's also a unit vector. Whereas if you were talking about generic vectors, like we would, like we were previously, we have to kind of also make sure that the reader is, uh, knows what shape all the, the individual vectors are that you're acting on. And what their lengths are. So this is something that is very nice about, um, about Dirac notation, okay? So now the next thing I want to be able to describe is just how we can end up using Dirac notation also to think about uh, operators. So an operator, again, what, or like a gate, what it will end up doing is it'll take a quantum distribution, psi, and map that to a new quantum distribution, say phi, okay? So the way that we can um, end up doing it, just like a permutation matrix, what it would do is it would take every vector E0, or Ex, and it'll, it would map those to E f of x. What a unitary matrix ends up doing is it, it will end up taking a, any input vector uh, x, and it'll map this forward to some new vector I'll call f of x. Now, one of the homework problems that I ended up giving you, so I won't, I won't prove it here, is that um, if it turns out that if 
x is not equal to y, or sorry, I guess if x and y are orthogonal, and the way we write that in Dirac notation is that the inner product between the two of them is zero, then what the unitary matrix, matrix will, will end up doing is it will end up mapping, um, it'll end up mapping U acting on Y and U acting on X to orthogonal vectors. Okay, so basically what unitary, the unitary matrix that ends up doing, and you know, you can end up seeing that the, um, that this property is true, because if we consider the inner product between say X and Y, and we promise that this is equal to zero, actually it turns out it doesn't matter if we promise it's equal to zero, then we can always write this as X times the identity matrix, acting on Y, right? Because the identity matrix don't do anything. So the identity matrix though can always be written as um, X U inverse U Y, which of course can be expressed as X U inverse inner product did with u, y, okay? So another fun fact about the transpose or the adjoint that I didn't mention. Another fun fact is that if we have any two uh, matrices in general, that the product between two matrices adjointed is the adjoint in the reverse order. So let's take a look at the, what the adjoint of U acting on X is. Well, we can use this property. And from this property, we find that this is just the adjoint of the ket vector X in the opposite order with the adjoint of the unitary matrix U. Now the adjoint of X just from the definition of Dirac notation is actually just the bra vector. So therefore the adjoint of U of UX dagger is uh, equal to X U dagger. So therefore this quantity over here is actually the inner product and I'm going to just use, explicitly use vector notation here of ux and uy, which of course is equal to, as we saw over here, the inner product of x and y. So the unitary transformation on two vectors cannot change their inner product, which is something that's really kind of neat about uh, unitary transformations. And what this ends up meaning in effect is that all unitary matrices describe basis transformations. The reason why I'm saying it, it's a basis transformation is because of the fact that fundamentally uh, it doesn't do anything to the relationship between the vectors in the space. If we have a set of, of vectors and we do a unitary transformation, you can see from the previous argument that all of their inner products remain the same, right? So for example, it, imagine we had, you know, these vectors over here, um, X and Y. And I, I, we decided that we wanted to rotate these two axes by some angle, okay? This would be a example of a basis transformation because uh, what ends up happening is that the, any vector that we wanted to represent 
in the primed coordinate system uh, versus the unprimed coordinate system has exactly the same uh, inner products with each other. And furthermore, the transformed basis vectors have the exact same inner products with everything else. So this process over here, applying a unitary transformation to a set of states is actually just equivalent to transforming its basis. So one of the, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about is, you know, if we think about it, actually, the same thing was happening before. So let's take a look at, you know, the following permutation matrix, give you a little bit more intuition, right? This is, this was again, the adder mod four. What this guy ends up doing is this matrix, again, maps E0 to E1, E1 to E2, E2 to E3, and E3 to E0, okay? So this matrix is, um, we can end up seeing as a basis transformation. What it does is it transforms every element of the original basis into a new element of the new basis. So essentially, all reversible computing was doing is it only transforms the basis. So we can end up viewing, right, every, when we start out with some probability distribution, let's say P is equal to, uh, I don't know, P1, going down all the way through P2 to the N, all that we're allowed to do in reversible computing is just permute these probabilities that we end up having down there. Of course, measurement allows us to indirectly change them, but all the fundamental operations just reevaluate that probability distribution in a new basis. Similarly, quantum computing is exactly the same. In quantum computing, we start with a quantum state vector, psi, which we of course can write as a0 plus b1, which of course in our previous notation would have just been a e0 uh, plus b e1, and such that now a squared plus b squared is equal to one. Now, our unitary transformations what they'll do is they'll, they can transform this psi into, into other psi's. However, there's one really, really key thing that we can do in quantum that we cannot do in reversible computing. And that is that we can kind of change the distribution. So let me show you um, one example and then we'll call it a day. So this example is a gate known as the Hadamard gate. So this is an example of a unitary transformation and a Hadamard gate has the, the following structure. It's of the form one, 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 minus one, all divided by square root two, all right? So specifically, if we go through and, uh, and this, Hadamard gate is uh, annoyingly, for reasons we'll see later, called H. And it has the property that, you know, H ket zero, which just to, so everybody recalls is, can be computed by the following, one over root two times ket zero, which is the same thing as E zero, which is one zero. This, in Dirac notation is just one over root two, zero from this times this, plus one from this times this. Which we could end up writing as the unit vector, one over root two, one, one. And similarly, H acting on one is uh, equal to one over root two, one minus one. You might wonder, hey, how did I do that calculation so quickly in my head? Right, especially because my head math really sucks, to be honest. The reason why I did that was because of this property that I described before. 
unitary transformations have to maintain the inner product. Now, Hadamard is a unitary transformation, and we can see that just by doing the algebra and expanding this out and noticing that it's self-inverse. We square Hadamard, we get back itself. Now, because they have to maintain the inner product, any inner product between this and that is zero, well, the inner product between the transformation of zero and the transformation of one has to also be zero. And this is the only choice that I end up getting once I know this. So you can use that property to speed up some calculations sometimes. But in any case, I digress. The key thing is, is that what we have with this transformation is we have a situation where we do, we do something that we could not do with reversible probabilistic computing. We had a distribution that was with 100% probability in the state zero. So this is a, this bit is, again, we can think of this as being zero with probability zero. I should also mention that this uh, bit, you know, for reasons that are equally kind of cute and annoying, um, called a qubit or quantum bit. Um, the, when we apply a Hadamard transform, we end up now getting a distribution that is a 50% distribution of zero and one. So it's kind of like, you know, this, think of this Hadamard operation, it's like flipping a coin, right? Once we take a state in, in, in uh, like, a uh, like the, the coin in heads, we flip it, we now have a 50-50 distribution of heads or tails, right? Okay, well, that's cool. Normally you could do that, and there's ways you could do that in reversible computing with, an, with a source of randomness and map that to a 50-50 probability distribution. But the problem is, is that, you know, once you once you flip the coin, right, you can't, you can't kind of unflip it in a natural way because reversible operations keep the, uh, um, can't decrease the amount of uncertainty that you end up having in a state or increase it for that matter. However, in quantum, if we apply the Hadamard transform on this again, because h squared is equal to identity, we can map this back to zero. So quantum actually gives us ways of monkeying with probabilities. And furthermore, one of the things that we're going to be seeing is that these minus signs are ultimately going to allow us to have different possibilities or different configurations that the quantum system, quantum distribution could be in, those possibilities are going to actually possibly interfere with each other. And the whole art of quantum computing really deep down, and the whole reason why we get anything as more powerful than reversible classical computing comes about because of techniques that we've developed to get the minus signs from some quantum configurations to interfere with the plus signs from other parts of the quantum distribution. And this wave interference between different parts of a calculation is essentially the central tool that ends up giving quantum computing all of its power and makes it different from the probabilistic reversible computing that we saw previously. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you, hope you all enjoyed it.